Okay, guys, you know how the show works. We go live. We answer questions for free from anybody that calls in. The phone number is 407-279-1754. Again, 407-279-1754. We've done this many, 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 many times for many years now. My name is attorney Walter Knott. I'm with Disability Resolution PA. I am the most viewed and subscribed to disability attorney in America. Now, we are going to change today the platform. Normally, we ask, do you want me to answer a question? Or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? I'm actually going to be going ahead and switching off of running hearing questions as an option. Uh, and the reason why is so many people call in to go ahead and do that after the show that, that we're going to have a basic option where you can call the firm, schedule an appointment, and I'll actually do an hour with you. But it's, it's going to be a pay thing because I can't really work with you and get you to the point where you need to be essentially without having a full hour to work you for your upcoming disability hearing. And we already have the first caller on the phone. We're going to go ahead and start and then we'll take the next caller. Uh, please remember, we're going to be doing this from around 9, 11 p.m. until about 10 p.m. I am injured today from the uh, horrible accident I had with the tractor with the trailer smashed into me. So if I do have to cut the short store, uh, the, uh, the video short, please understand. I'm having massive swelling in my back from where a trailer jackknifed into me as I jumped off the tractor. Let's get right to it. Good, sir. Use a fake name throughout this process. Uh, can I help you with a question? Go ahead. Hello, Walter. My name is uh, Michael. I have a couple of questions. I have, I just, uh, about two weeks ago, I got a, um, um, what do you call the approval letter from the disability? Yes, sir. A word mm -hmm. letter. Uh -huh. And then um, the only thing I'm, uh, I've been waiting for almost 10 months. Finally, I got approval. The only thing, the two questions I have, one of them, I don't see any CDR request on the award form. Uh -huh. uh, that's one question. And the other, second question is, um, and also I work for the company, you know, the group insurance, they may pay a little money too, but I haven't seen any letter from them yet. They might get paid too. Is that something unearned income if they pay? So uh, am I getting in trouble with the social security? I mean, I can't work anyway, but they say they may uh, uh, pay some money too, along with uh, social security benefit too. Is Usually... Yeah, usually the letter, uh, it sometimes says it is, sometimes doesn't. If there is a likely to be scheduled CDR in the future, the one thing you can do is call the local field office and ask them if their computer system has already set a scheduled date for a future CDR. It usually comes in the form of a one-year, three-year, seven-year, or 10-year, but it can be even a six-month situation. I've seen those. I don't know if those are legal yet. I have to look into it, but I've seen six months down the line, but uh, one year is, three year is, seven year is, 10 years. Um, then obviously they can just keep using the one year over and over. And if they find any potential fraud or anything that they might think is fraud, they'll begin a CDI, CDR uh, basically at any point. Now, when you say insurance, what kind of insurance payment are you talking about? The group insurance from the workplace. Okay, so like LTD benefit, like oh. walk, walk me through it, yeah. From, from Prudential, you know, that they are the one paying me for the uh, short term, and now I'm in the long term now. They they say something, they may pay something because the, the, the social security, they didn't pay much. They only pay 1200 or something. And then they, because of the one I earn, I pay a lot of money for during the work time, about 16 years with the company and then they say they may they may pay some money to the the the, the provincial one Okay, so assuming, all right, so here's the thing. First thing, LTD benefits, they're going to try and I'm assuming you've been getting the check every month while waiting to be found disabled, correct? Yes. All right, so they're going to try and take a lot of your back pay. So don't spend your back pay cuz they're going to be, you know, a lot of it's theirs if not all of it. Next thing is if it's group disability coverage, usually that goes on a W2, which is considered income. So bottom line, um, I mean, yeah, if you have extra funds coming your way, you have to see what kind of actual funding that is and then do a Google search to figure out. Because here's the problem with these insurance questions or pension questions. I'm not there to read the contract that's specific to your type of benefit received. So a pension might fall into what a regular pension is 
unless it was written 50 years ago and then it doesn't and then I'm wrong. Or, you know, it might be a situation where these additional group benefits going your way could be considered an income. But I don't know what you're getting. Like, that's the thing is when you say group work insurance, I mean, that could be a lot of things. So point is, once you get that, go find out specifically what it is and then do a search as to the type of payment you're receiving. Is it something that's a base salary? Is it something that's a W-2 reportable? What is its status as a taxable item? And then from there, once you have that, then I can always kind of talk to you more about specifics. But what your real question is, is additional income going to hurt me for SSDI purposes? Now, look, are we talking more than $1,470 per month or are we talking less than $1,470 per month? I really don't know. The only thing, let me explain. Let sure. me. I, I think I missed a couple of things. I'm next month. I'm going to be 64. Number one for the first question. You may maybe have another idea. The, this one, I work for the company about 16, 17 years, and then you know the social security. The, um, what do you call the? Uh, we pay and the company matching to. That's the one potential group insurance when I get hurt about 19, 20 months ago mm -hmm. and they took over, they pay me for short term and uh, long term. Long term, right? yeah. Still paying uh, long term. Does that help you? Uh, it does, but the same thing, like, you know, at the end of the day, uh, assuming that you paid into this and they're matching and then they're giving it back to you, I'd have to see exactly what it is. Because look, did, oh, did you already pay taxes on it? Did you not already pay taxes on it? Is it considered an income to you or is it considered some cost sharing thing? Is it like a 401k? I did pay. Oh, you I did pay I, taxes? I, I, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so this is an income. This is just put away as a reserve thing. That's like a, a backup when things hit the fan sort of gig. The way I, my understanding when I spoke with them this week, um, they saying because uh, they pay a uh, little more than the social security paying and they try to match it, the balance kind of like that. Does that make sense? Okay. I, one more time. I was responding to a gentleman who made a $2 donation. Thank you. Thank you to that gentleman. That's super duper awesome. Um, but go ahead and say that one more time. Go ahead. So the, 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 um, you know, the, in order for me to qualify for the insurance, what do you call that insurance? That's the one LTD or but, yeah, LTD. Okay. Yes. And they, they are the one they saying they may pay a little bit money too, because, um, uh, what do you call, um, because the, 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 the company, sorry, the total security is not, they not paying enough for me. And then they may pay a little money too. So, and then I see in your show a couple of times, I, the, people questioning and then you can like a double dipping or something and then something like that you see what i mean i just don't want to get in trouble but they say they may pay but they they, they going to let me know next week and all the spreadsheet and how much they're going to pay how much the social security going to pay all that is it make sense i got you here's what's probably going to happen because you know remember there's details i might not have here but here's what's probably going to happen they're going to go ahead and take your approval letter and how much back pay you have and do a calculation against it as to how much they're going to take of it. There you go. Yep, that's yeah. It. And then the other thing that's going to happen is, you know, basically they're going to cut off the LTD benefits going forward. Once you have your forward pay benefits coming in from SSDI. So, okay. yeah, that that's what's probably going to, you're probably not going to get any extra coming in from LTD. It's probably just going to be the transfer where they're taking benefits from you and you're swapping over to SSDI instead of being on the LTD ticket. Oh, I see. I see. Some things they say they 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 pay a portion or something kind of like that. I have to see your plan. Like that's the toughest thing with LTD and especially short-term display benefits. Because man, that's that's a contract of contracts right there. But like they're all different. You know what I mean? Like I and like I look at and I look at them. And I'm like, well, this one's different than that one, and that one's different than that one. It's just they're all different. That's why it's so it's such a pain in the butt to. And everybody always has questions about like that particular contra oh no i think i hung up on him i hit the button hold on let me see if i can get him back i'm sorry let me see. wait there's no way i can know hold on let me let me see if i can get him back uh hold on guys because this uh i can get him back i found him i found him got him right here got him right here hold on let me get this uh let me get this over here let me connect it to the speaker I accidentally hit the off button, so let me let me get him back real quick. 
Hello? We got you back. Okay, wonderful. Excellent. All right. So bo- sorry about that. I, I kept Xing out of the people who were calling in and I, I accidentally hit it too many times. But um, okay. So yeah. So next step is find out what they're going to be doing and talking about and f- get the actual contractual agreement that you are aligned with for the LTD benefits and get the short term disability benefit one too. Um, and uh, at that point, then we can kind of have a more in-depth in depth discussion. Although, to be honest with you, I'm not going to have a chance to read through your LTD program. So bottom line is um, read through it and then be able to feed me answers when you call in next time. Yeah. Okay, no problem. And also, um, because um, I mentioned, uh, you know, I didn't mention that from the beginning, I'm turning 64 for the CDR they didn't put it on the word letter or is it something they normally put it on the letter i'm not sure about that you know so what i usually especially if it's going to be there is if the person um you know basically does not have the capacity to utilize their own benefits they have to have a payee i'll usually see a lot of them putting on their cdr to heads up the potential payee that's not a hard and fast thing it's just something i've noticed that tends to pop up it's not like they have a rule that you know, essentially is dictating that. But the point is, um, you're 64. I don't see them doing many past 63. Because remember, at 62, you hit retirement. 63, you're so many years away from full retirement. It's just financially is not worth it for them to go after people. Because there's a lot of fish in the sea that are younger that are, you know, potentially not disabled where they can save bigger money on. Okay. I mean, uh, I heard um, uh, in your thing too long time ago, I've been listening a lo- lo- long time, sure. and then some question they say, um, if it's like uh, close to retirement age or something, they don't, sometimes they don't do the CDR, something like that. I'm not Correct. sure. Just, yeah, there's no point know. to. You're, you're too damn old. That's the thing. Like, look, if they've got somebody that's 32 receiving disability benefits, and there's a potential where they're not as disabled or severe as they used to be, who do you think is a better target to save money? You or the 32-year-old? Well, obviously not you because you're not going to live as long as that 32-year-old likely as a result of impairments. So they're going to have to spend less money on you versus the money they have to spend on the 32-year-old. I see. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Good, sir. I will catch you later. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. Well, uh, thank you for calling me back. And that was so nice. Thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you, good, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. YouTube. So I'm going to answer one question um, from the chat section. Uh, Ivory Brown had the question, Walter, could you please tell me, are there multiple hearings? Yeah, sometimes. So the thing is this, initial filing, no hearing, just EDS. Reconsideration, no hearing, just EDS. I mean, you could have a hearing here. It's kind of like a quasi-informal one, or you go in and it's still informal because you're sitting behind like this glass thing and you're talking to a DDS rep and not a judge. But the point is, and this is buzzing, the point is um, if we're talking about real hearings with real judges, right? Administrative law judges, the SSA docket system, initial filing, no hearing, reconsideration, no hearing, hearing, ALJ hearing level. You can still do hearings here, but most people do, you know, basically form submission uh, to have a decision made. Like, you know, they're not doing the informal conference. They're not doing that. They're just doing those. Then up here at the hearing level, that's where you go in front of the judge. If you go to appeals council, you're not going to have a hearing. If you go to the district court level, it's up to the judge to go ahead and decide if you're going to have some sort of hearing. But the judge will usually not incorporate the claimant as part of the adjudications. I mean, you can always come in and see it, but they're usually not there for those adjudications. If the judge does a remand, appeals council grabs it, either agrees or disagrees. If they agree, they send it back to the administrative law judge. And you can have another hearing. So in that instance, yes, it's where there was a denial at the ALJ hearing level. You went to appeals council, went to a higher level court, uh, district circuit or supreme. Somewhere a remand occurred, sent it back to the SSA, the appeals council. Appeals council either agrees or disagrees and then sends it, if they agree, back to the ALJ. The ALJ at that point begins the process of doing an additional hearing. And then, of course, they just fit you in when they have an opening. That's how that works. Cool. Let's take the next call. I'm just going to wait for it to ring. Uh... Let me get this thing working. Hold on one second. My phone is unfortunately going through a minor seizure at the moment. 
Okay. Hi, this is Attorney Walter Knott. We are live right now. Remember to use a fake name throughout this process. Would you like me to answer a question? And go ahead with your question. Hi, Walter. I hope you're going to be okay. You didn't hurt your back too much, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know? Oh. I just had a, um, um, let me try to be quick, a question about um, Medicare. Sure. A new Medicare policy from 2021. I did write in about it before that I just found out uh, last month that um, sedation for spinal for some spinal procedures are not being covered. Okay. Because they say um, only um, topical, like if you get shots of lidocaine in your back, you're good. But if you need more, you got to pay for it out of pocket, okay. which I have to do. And I'm wondering, um, I I have a Medicare Advantage plan, dual complete. That's for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. Okay. And I'm just wondering why doesn't Medicaid pick up, Wait, pick Medica it up for me? Medicare or Medicaid? I have both. Okay. So it's a, all right. Dual allowance. Um, so why don't they basically have some sort of anesthesia for your pain management related to, I think you said it was the spine, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like a public policy question. Um, I, I don't know the direct answer to why they would limit you, to be honest with you. Um, but let's take a moment and think about it. Um, what is the cost of you know, a potential anesthesiologist. Hold on. So cost per hour. Okay. So well, it's $200 if you get, um, they put you under like with uh, propofol or something. Okay. $100 for IV sedation, $50 for nitrous. The clinic is trying to address the issue because they know it's a, it's a hardship. Because all this time, you know, they basically were eating it for the last two years, only getting reimbursed 98% of the time. But that's, that's called my insurance. Like, why aren't you paying them? And this is the result because you haven't paid them. But, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to uh, make people know what's going on if they're in my situation. So first thing I would say is this, um, it's saying here hourly wage of an anesthesiologist is 176 to $230 per hour or cost ranges widely, but it's typically around 400 for the first 30 minutes and then another 150 for each additional 15 minutes thereafter. So cost, very expensive. That's going to add up real quick. Uh, another thing is that it could be a deterrent to people getting that type of resulting surgery. Um, or for lesser types of, you know, cause remember if it's a pain thing and they're just doing some pain shots or whatever, you know, as opposed to open back surgery, you know, um, the smaller potential required anesthesiologists, they might not want to do that stuff because, you know, people are going to get those more often, more regularly. And as a result, it's a lot of little costs that add up versus the one big cost for the big surgery that is a potential fix. Um, I'm sure there's other yeah, reasons. For yeah, epidurals and like nerve blocks, but like nerve ablations, you know, there's no charge. So they, you, you can't do it without sedation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, totally. They're not, yeah, they're not going to do that without it. But, but you know, remember, too, one of the big problems that they have is that the Medicare trust fund, you know, obviously Medicaid's the general tax kind of gig, but Medicare trust fund is supposed to run out before essentially the retirement trust fund. So, you know, they're trying to save money wherever they can. I think you made a good point. Um, you know, although I, I would say this um, at the end of the day, they are not creating future investments of this country that redirect funds that it makes to the social security accounts, which is what Bill Clinton wanted to do. Um, and then he got impeached because of the Oval Office. So we've just been on this downward spiral ever since then. Um, you know, obviously, Republican side, the Bushes, Trump, stuff like that, they're not going to really do much with it. The Democrat side, a lot of promises, you know, Obama, you know, Biden, stuff like that. 
Um, point of what I would say is um, write it up. We'll do a video on it about the causes and negativity of it. I'll do some research and then we'll get a video out there and we'll get some views and get some awareness, you know? Oh, that would be so awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Because what if somebody has anxiety or they flinch? You don't want to flinch when you have a needle going into your spinal canal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had a really People negative. Like, oh, you're fine. I said, lady, you've never been laying on a table. Yeah. I the right length. Never pierced my uh, spine, uh, spinal cord to get the, uh, the fluid out of it, uh, for, for, for basically doing what they needed to do. And he put a ton, ton of that, you know, numbing effect around there, but he failed five times to get it right. Um, and, uh, I wasn't right for like six months after that. Cause they, they were like, Oh, bud patch, it'll be awesome. And I was bleeding fluid for a long time, long time. Um, I'm surprised you didn't get a spinal fluid leak. I did. I had, you know, that horrible headache. I did. I did. I was I for, oh, you did? yeah, for two weeks, I wasn't able to function. That was back in law school. Shitty times. Yeah. Yeah. Bad deal. But um, yeah, yeah. I've had, horrible. yeah, I, I have a history of doing incredibly dumb things. Um, one time I had to, I went boogie boarding in a hurricane, which was fun until this weird little wave picked me up and slammed me through the water it was like four feet of water that it slammed me through directly. My head smashed against basically the sandy bottom in Florida, of course. And it burst my eardrum. Then I went to Advent health, their Advent health doctor couldn't find that my eardrum had burst. Then I went to an ear doctor like the day later He's like, there's a giant hole in your ear. I was like, I know there's a problem. So, you know, point being, um, yeah, I, I get it. We should do awareness about it. Um, write something up. I'll do some research, add to it, and then we can always do a, a call in where you call in during the live or we'll do a pre recorded video and hopefully we can create some awareness about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd really appreciate it. There's, there's, there's many of us that I, I go on periodically like every five, six months so I can function. But, uh, yeah, it is a terrible thing. It's hard right now. And, but, <laughs> You gotta do what you gotta do for meanwhile. But I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me so very much. And Absolutely. I'm grateful for everything that you do. Perfect. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Well, you have a wonderful, wonderful night. You too. Thank you Bye, so Walter. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. So guys, we're gonna go ahead and take the next call um, and, and get right into it. I am starting to fade a little bit, but I've still got some get her done. Uh, please go ahead and ask me a legal question. Yes. Son, he is 19 mm -hmm. and he graduated high school. Okay. And, um, you know, that he had, I had to fill out a form for his leisure and his activities. Okay. To see if he is still eligible. Okay. Um, well, you know, they called me back and she's like, um, you know, let's cancel the evaluation. So last week I got another call. Uh, and I guess because she canceled because they had gotten like his school records in. Right. And uh, so I had just gotten another call saying, okay, well, we do need you to come back in, but this time it'll be for a mental examination. My question is, I do want him to work, okay. but should I wait till the um, exam or can he go ahead? So that's why I wasn't too sure on yet. So just to summarize and, and keep in mind, I'm fading a little bit because of the injury, but um, you have a child the child wants to work. You've got an exam coming up at the SSA. You want to know, should the child work before the exam or should the child not work before the exam? So my answer when it comes to work is always the same thing. Failed work attempts are very powerful, especially with adjudicators, especially with high level adjudicators. A lot of people don't realize, but many of the judges sitting at the SSA deciding disability claims are disabled veterans. Uh, what they look for when they hire the judges there are, you know, you get extra points if you're a minority, you get extra points if you're disabled, you get extra points if you're a veteran. So bottom line is a lot of them are that, you know, you could get, you could literally have somebody score a 100 uh, or rather like a 99. And then somebody who is all of those other things could get a lower score and then still be picked. 
So point is, um, they like to see work history and they like to see somebody attempting. What the rule is looking at is, can they do repetitive and continuous work at or above SGA, okay, $1,470. But the, the bottom line is this. Um, I look at these claims and what the judges usually look for, and they usually look for somebody who works for about three months at a job and then gets fired and then tries another job, works two weeks, gets fired, works another job for two months, gets fired. They look for failed work attempts because that dictates to them that, A, the real world of jobs spit them back out. Not some vocational expert saying, hey, they might be able to do this, this, or this, right? Not something on paper where it's like, hey, they could potentially do this, maybe. But the real world job spit them back out. And my point to you with that is that, yes, you should have him attempt to work. And the moment you start him having to attempt to work, his impairments are going to get more severe. The more severe the impairments the better he's probably going to do in front of the CE doctor, so long as the attorney advises him on what the statute language is, symptoms, signs, questions they're likely to ask, et cetera. Okay. Because I know the lady, she had asked me on the phone, you know, well, did he graduate? And I said, you know, yes. But I said he's going to be going back to school um, and until he ages out. Um and, you know, they're going to help him, like, 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 career tech. You know, they have to wear, like, a uniform. Sure. So when I did tell her, you know, eventually, you know, I do want him to work. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, that's fine. And remember, I mean, if he's got some work under his belt, if he's under snag SSDI benefits or at least a hybrid with SSDI and SSI, and his main goal is going to be to pay into Medicare so that at least he's got the high-level coverage compared to Medicaid. Okay. All right. I thank you. Absolutely. You have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. So guys, I'm, uh, I'm starting to waver a little bit. I can feel uh, my back is like, I have a hump basically on the back where if I lean back and you see me leaning forward because I can feel this hump kind of full of blood, but we're going to do one more call and then I'm just going to, going to call it a night. Um, Okay. Howdy, this is Attorney Walter Not. Remember to go ahead and mute the computer on your end. Uh, uh, we use a fake name throughout this process. And uh, what is your legal question? Hi. Um, I have a son that has um, SSI right now, and okay. he is being approached for SSDI. He has some work experience. Cool. Um, I guess enough work credit to qualify. Sure. But he has a neurological disorder. So, I want, I'm, as I'm filling out the 3368, I want to figure out what additional information I can put on to help him LSDL for the 3368. Well, 3368 is just like what medicine is he taking? You know, what medical facilities has he been to? The, the one that really is important is the 3373. So have you gotten that one yet or no? 3373, no. Yeah. So the one that's going to matter the most with testimony that can potentially harm him is the 3373. The 3368, that's just. You know, where has he been for medical, basic contact information? Is there somebody else that we can contact about your claim? What are the medications uh, that the child is currently taking? You know, uh, who prescribed the medications? Um, you know, has the child any prison, penal, jail, anything like that kind of stuff? Is there any other organization that might have medical documentation related to the child? Are there any additional remarks that you might have? you know, with the medication, what's the reason for the medicine? It doesn't have what the side effects are. That pops in later with other forms. But um, bottom line is that's not the form that you really want to, you know, do a stellar job on. The one you want to do a stellar job on is the 3373. How old is the child? He is 23 now. Yeah. So he's an adult. He gets the 3373. So type into Google SSA, a 3373 PDF. That'll pop up. You're going to go ahead okay. and work on that one. Um, I have a video somewhere out there about how to fill out the 3373. If you can't find it, um, then just go ahead and shoot me an email, and I'll, I'll do a quick search and find it, and then I'll, I'll shoot you an email back with it. Okay, terrific. Um, one other thing is that he's also being, uh, going through the CDR for SSI right now. So sure. he has an appointment with a neurologist, I think, next month. Sure. So I, I, it's a two-hour process. So I presume that whatever outcome, 
the neurologist comes up with this, what the determination would be, what he qualifies as and qualified for, right? Well, and the neurologist is going to give a basic summary as to medical diagnostic impression, uh, analysis okay. of, you know, how the child, or the adult did on some tests that were conducted, uh, maybe a vocational uh, summary as to work capacity. Um, but, you know, bottom line is that's one doctor of hopefully many that you have that provide a medical opinion as to, you know, how severe the child is. If they find improvement via the eight-step sequential process, which are the elements they use in a CDR, then they will begin the process of trying to remove the child's benefits. Uh, and then the tough thing is most, almost all, pretty much every disability attorney no longer does CDRs. We used to do them. We do like one, two a year now. We lose money on ones we win. So it's just, you know, one of those things. But um, bottom line is this, um, <clears throat> if you run into that problem, you can always kind of check in with me and we can talk about the specific impairments and what they're looking for and how to bolster the claim and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, so it sounds like CDR is a pretty much as odds against me. And it's not odds against you. Like you keep in mind the SSA, the, the CDR doctors, the CEMEs, consultant examination, medical expert doctors, they tend to be biased. They just tend to be biased. So, you know, that's a problem. Whereas, you know, your doctors can be neutral or against you or biased. But at the end of the day, what you have to keep in mind is like, as long as you make the claim look like the thing that they want, you're okay. You know, you got to make it look like the fish they're fishing for. And the statute language makes it look like the fish they're fishing for, you know. Okay. All right. I'll keep that in mind. Because I did put a lot of, I did use your approach, which is using the additional page. And I fill out five additional pages to answer each question. Um, really kind of outline, not the best case scenario, but like the worst case that he has. And so hopefully yeah. that kind of um, reinforces what the SSA uh, the doctor is looking at and it matches up. Just be careful with too many statements as to the. Remember, when you fill out these forms, it's kind of like talking to a police officer with just the answer, nothing more, nothing less, because you might offer information that they can use against the child. And remember, when they come to you, they're going to be sending you a 3380 as a third party that oversees the child as to give testimonies to what the child can do with that home activities, work activities, you know, stuff like landscaping, showering, you know, paying bills, cooking, cleaning, laundry, etc. cetera. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. So hopefully everything goes well. If not, I may uh, have to retain the services for future help. So, but Perfect. I appreciate your help the few times I call you already. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Okay. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So guys, I'm going to actually uh, cut the video a little bit short tonight. I've got this giant hump thing going on on the back of my back because when I jumped off and I lucked out, the damn trailer slid in too the fatty part of your kind of lower back right here. So, um, I mean, not there's organs there that are essential to surviving, but you know, it was lucky that it wasn't directly into my spine. But the point is I do a very, very dumb thing, which is I will go ahead and the amount of time I have to lay on the ground after getting injured usually dictates whether or not I go to the hospital. And if it's like over 30 minutes, then I need <laughs> to go to the, if it's like 10, 20 minutes, eh, I'll be all right. So this was like a 10, 20 minutes thing where I'm just laying on the ground. Nobody's around. And uh, it's the middle of like a field. But anyways, uh, point is, I will catch you guys a little bit later. You have a, a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you to all the people who donated. I always super appreciate that. They helped me out with my student loans immensely. Um, uh, uh, Laetroit, thank you for the $2 donation. Uh, and again, thank you for an additional $2 donation. That's incredible. I didn't even see that. Thank you. That's super good. Um, and we'll catch you guys a little bit later and uh, we'll do a longer one next week. I'm just, I'm just uh, I, like the fever is rising. I can feel my face sweating a lot. So I will catch you later. Have a wonderful night and we will go from there. Thank you so much, everybody. Sleep well. Take care of yourself. All righty. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.